Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine, and I'm here with John. Hey, John. Hello. Well, we are without Rob this week, and also we are recording remotely because there's a pandemic, and we also figured that it would be best to just record kind of a shorter episode to see how this goes. So I picked a short story that's available in its entirety on Electric Lit, and it's a short story probably that we would classify as like flash fiction uh, by a writer named Kristen Arnett. It's so short that I'm just going to read uh, one of the the longer paragraphs at the beginning here, but the story is called Gator Butchering for Beginners. Start with the head. The initial incision should be sharp, precise. Don't hesitate. This will be the toughest part. Do you know how hard it is to end a thing? They'll say, wait. They'll say, I still love you. Remember making out in your car after work? How we named the dog three times before anything stuck? That weekend at the beach, we fed birds and one landed on your bare shoulder, then sang for us? That's a gator mating call. A bellow, rippling vibrations meant to stun prey. Heft the knife and feel for an artery. Nothing's worse than something left half dead, bleeding, howling. So go for the throat. It'll help if you drink enough beforehand to razor sharpen your words. Slip someone else's name into bed between the two of you. Thrust the dagger called apathy and slice without hesitation. After, hack free the skull. Keep it at your bedside. A gentle reminder not to call at 2 a.m. I found this story just like looking for really short fiction stories. I don't know if I actually looked for flash fiction, but this was one of these ones that grabs you immediately because it's called gator butchering and all, like all the action words and verbs. It was just gross and visceral. <laughs> yeah. And so it was yeah. really easy to read. And um, I think it's a really nice kind of story to show people because even though it is flash fiction and I should have looked, I, I'll look up the words now while we're talking, but um, it, it achieves everything that you hope for in a longer piece but it's it's that quick so i thought it was a good example of that but did you like it john i know you i think oh, i yeah. brought it before yeah you brought it to the workshop like a year ago mm-hmm. or last year at some point mm-hmm. i don't remember if you were doing prompts based on them at the time but i think we were if we were just discussing but yeah it was uh obviously um like you said visceral and also emotional it, it created a great um setting it used the uh, occasion of the gator butchering to kind of speak to a larger idea right and it was very engaging and like those two levels right yeah so i just looked it up and it's about 600 words just shy of 600 words so it's really short like you can read this in a matter of like five minutes you know yeah tell the listeners that you can read this really quickly (laughs) do it there's no excuse (laughs) but yeah to your point what i realized obviously like when you read the story it's one of those stories that you just you enjoy at face value and you enjoy it in the moment for me i think when i had to kind of revisit it knowing that we were going to talk about it today i realized that probably the other reason that it really sticks with you is because it is this kind of extended metaphor. Yeah. So you're you're remembering all of the really graphic parts of butchering a gator, which the way this author describes it, you kind of wonder if she's done it because it, it seems that precise. Like she goes in, into detail about like hacking the skull and then like why the tail is the hardest part to do. And then throughout there's this like metaphor of breaking up with someone and making sure that it's done so well that there's nothing dead or there's nothing like left alive still to kind of come back and reanimate. So that metaphor I think is like done so well and it's done so precisely instead of saying like a breakup. Yeah. She talks about remember making out in the car and so that that bit that I read is the first line that uh, kind of reminds you well introduces this metaphor. Um, It says wait they'll say I still love you. Remember making out in your car after work. So she never really comes out and says by the way I'm, I'm comparing this to something. Yeah. Yeah but as soon as she introduces that the rest of it is just like oh almost like mention of certain things. So it says later in one of these paragraphs when she's talking about actually hacking the tail up, she talks about forget middle names, Christmas gifts, the flavor of icing on that first birthday cake you shared. So it's just it's just these random memories and whether or not they're ones that she had to like come up with, you know, and string together or if for her they're actually reminiscent of an actual breakup. They're like generic enough that they apply to everyone, right? Everybody's got a middle name and Christmas gifts and all that kind of stuff. So I thought that was so like so well done instead of like talking about feelings or anything. She's just talking about like actual tangible scenes almost in a relationship. Yeah, that's that's actually she bridges the concrete experience of butchering a gator with the concrete experience. 
experiences with uh, a significant other. Even there's a couple of uh, very specific things like, uh, like you said, the Christmas uh, flavor of ice cream on that first birthday cake you shared, an unshaved ankle rubbing against your calf under body warmed sheets, stuff like that. I think that moving from the concrete of the gator butchering to the concrete of the relationship specifics without kind of saying it, like you said, she doesn't say these things are similar in this way. She says she just moves between them kind of with this fluidity that lets you make those connections. Right. What I was also impressed with was the fact that this is like such a, it's a really visual story, like I said, and it's it's just kind of gross if you're really reading and thinking about butchering something as like strong and huge as a gator, right? It's it's like disemboweling like a human. It's, it's that big a carcass, right? So it's not like, I don't know, stepping on a cockroach or something. Like you really have to deal with this big dead gator. And she's just comparing that and it's, I don't know, I, the whole time I'm reading it, I'm thinking like, well, that's so brutal, you know? Whoever is able to do this it must be like a horrible person. But then what she ends up comparing it to are these like really sort of tender everyday moments in a relationship. And um, it kind of tells you that the breakup for this character is the brutal part, but it's only brutal because like the relationship itself was really good, right? You don't get the sense that this person's like a nut job. It's just kind of like you really, really, really have to do the breakup right so that these wonderful memories are not haunting you. You know, you have to put an end to it. So I don't know. I thought that was really expertly done. I'm trying to think of like another story where you can describe something so graphic like that, but still have a, not a nice feeling, but it's almost like nostalgic or it's a little sad. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting dichotomy where you you are grossed out by it, but then sad about it at the same time. Yeah. And not just like sad for the gator either, because I'm definitely one of the people that would read it that way, but... <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're sad for, I mean, because she, she's talking about memories that you kind of have to hold on to and or let go of, you know, it's disemboweling a gator, but it's disemboweling a relationship, right? Uh -huh. Just spilling its guts all over the floor in both cases. So there's a, there's there's both grossness and sadness in both of those things. Right. And I wonder when, when I read something like this, that like, there's really nothing I didn't enjoy about it. it I feel like it's the perfect length for something like this. I feel like when you're going to do an extended metaphor like that, you can definitely like overdo it and go too far with it and it'll get to the point where I'm you know I feel like I've read everything I'm gonna read about it so the length for me was perfect like it gave you enough that it didn't feel like it ended out of nowhere but it didn't go on and on and on and like kind of belabor this yeah this is this like with flash fiction in general I think is it tries to create a single effect like Edgar Allan Poe's concept of the single effect where we're getting this metaphor and that's pretty much all it's gonna do it, it can dive into it and it can and develop it and make it resonant in a lot of ways, but it's not going to then go on and try to do something else because it's it's just flash fiction. That's all it is. You know, it's this is what we get. Right. But I think you could this could be a part of a larger thing if it didn't linger in this metaphor. If it tried to do something else afterwards, it could move yeah. on to something. Because this actually reminded me of a piece I brought to the workshop, I don't know, years ago, where I tried to make a similar comparison where I had a character having a, a sexual encounter with a prostitute. Oh. And then I described everything metaphorically in terms of a public hanging to try to like bring those two ideas to the same, you know, kind of bridge this. Not as skillfully as she did, I should say. I did it differently than she did. And I think she does it a little better than maybe the way I did it there. But then that piece moved on to something else. It wasn't just that for the whole thing. Yeah, I remember that. And I don't remember exactly your story, but maybe like, like one of the differences was that the two things that you were describing were both kind of, you know, an encounter with a prostitute, not an encounter with his wife, first off. So there's something kind of weird and gross about that. Plus a public hanging, like that, I mean, that's like a shock factor right there. So like here she's comparing like something shocking and something normal, which does like almost like double duty for a metaphor, right? Yeah. And then tell me if I'm wrong, but I feel like yours was almost done in scene. It was done in scene, yeah. Which it is was different. Which is, yeah, it's, it's different. And she, like I said, she goes from concrete things in the gator to concrete things in the relationship. Whereas I think the thing I did was I described things in terms of the other, yes. of the metaphor. Yes. Yes. So like I would describe, I forget, I don't remember the words I used, but I would describe like the, uh, the room in terms of like a desert. So the room he walks into is whatever, but the way I described it, I tried to evoke desert situation where this public hanging is happening. Right. Yeah. So not that there's a good or bad way to do 
it. But I think probably what works with her format here is that it is done in such a tight space. And like you said, it's it's just trying to achieve that one effect. And so how do you do that quickly? And it's probably not in scene unless it, I don't know, were to start in scene with the breakup. I think what's kind of expertly done here is that the only part in scene is the actual like gator butchering. And it's not even like in scene so much as like reading a recipe where That's you're, right. like you're like it's an instruction manual, which I don't know, there's an element of in scene with how instructions are laid out for you. But this is like that Lori Moore uh, uh, second person imperative self-improvement manual. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what you do. Step A, do this. Yes. Step B, do that. Yeah, interesting. One thing I noticed about the way she bridges concrete details is she moves from the concrete to an abstract and then down to another back to the concrete on the other side. So in um, the first paragraph, she's talking about uh, wedging your knife below the bumpy ridge of the spine, loosen tendon from pink sticky meat. Then she says, flay everything open. And everything is kind of reaching past the concrete into an abstract because everything is not specific, right? And then she says, pry free the heart. And the heart could have two meanings. Yeah. Because the heart could be the physical heart of the gator that you're just ripping out. Or it could be like your metaphorical heart, like your feelings about the relationship that you're about to flay open and pry free. And she does that over and over again in here, I think. Yeah, she says, the initial incision should be sharp, precise. Don't hesitate. This will be the toughest part. Do you know how hard it is to end a thing? That's again, has two meanings. Like you're yeah. ending, yeah. like you could be killing something in order to butcher it, or you could be ending a relationship. And the a later paragraph, gutting's ugly work, airing what's decayed in secret. That what is decayed Decayed in secret has two meanings in there. It has what's being digested inside of the gator and what you're holding inside of you as like a uh, the reasons you're going to break up this relationship that have to be aired out in order to to end it. I don't know. She does that a lot through here where these little lines, these little phrases kind of stand in both places at the same time where they could represent an idea for the physical act of butchering a gator and they can represent an idea for ending a relationship at the same time. The only... The- the other thing that she does here that's um, interesting in terms of like the format is is how like similar to an instruction manual, she's got these single sentences that stand in their own paragraphs. So there's like an intro and then there's the part that I read that says start with the head. And then there's another paragraph and it says next, the belly. And then there's another paragraph and it says harvest the worthwhile scrape, the tail. And then the last one is digest. And there's a paragraph after that that ties the metaphor all, all together. I think that's also just kind of worth mentioning because when there, when you are writing something like flash fiction, I think sometimes it's hard to do much more than one thing, like you said. And she still kind of managed to throw in these sentences that add this other layer, which makes it feel like instructions. And I don't know what else to say about it except that I that I noticed it. And it does kind of lend like a, a slight kind of format. Like, you know, maybe if her idea was, I'm going to compare butchering to a relationship that could get out of hand really fast or it could go on too long or it could be something that you read and you don't really know what what the arc is necessarily and like she kind of gave herself an arc by saying do this do this do this and then do this yeah she's kind of distilling it down to its stages or steps right yeah what do you what do you need to do to end a relationship you got to do this this and this what do you have to do to butcher a gator you got to do this this and this right. and just kind of line them up and and make them work together for the metaphor yeah. yeah it's good when i when i see stories like this that like i said are i don't know how to fault them at all i, th- I think a story like this is just so perfect i wonder what came first for her you know like i said was it the metaphor or was it i'm gonna explain how to butcher a gator but wait i'm gonna do this instead or or maybe the the idea for a story was just like i'm gonna write what it's like to end a relationship really violently you know and this is a metaphor she either had to like really reach for or one that came kind of naturally i don't know if she's like from florida or what (laughs) you know what i mean like uh now that i live in florida things like gators are like really interesting to me still and always will be because i'm from ohio yeah so if i was gonna write this like a gator for me would feel so exciting instead of I don't know comparing it to any other like normal critter I could find somewhere else there's just so many things about this and it's so short that it's the reason I keep sharing it and thinking of it when I think of like flash fiction yeah oh I see that absolutely and it has I think your favorite uh, POV <laughs> yeah I do really like second that. person 
<laughs> I don't know what it is. It only works like in that second person stuff. I mean, not to belabor this mini episode, but I think the reason I do like that is because usually when something is told in that point of view, it's like summarizing something in hindsight with this like sweeping kind of wisdom, right? She's describing a breakup, not as it's happening, but like as an instruction to either herself or the actual reader or someone else, because it sounds like she's an expert at it and she's done it before. And so when you tell someone like how to do it in that second person, it almost sounds like this is a concept that's been in the author's mind for a long time, kind of like simmering into this piece of fiction. It's not told in scene. It's kind of like, this is a feeling I want to convey. And I'm so I'm not going to tell it in scene because there's not one scene that does it justice or there's not one arc or story or plot. It's a feeling. And I feel like the feelings are best communicated in, in second person, which a lot of times to me, because I think it is best done when it's quick and short because it gets exhausting to read it for much longer than this. It ends up feeling a little more like poetry to me. Oh, yeah. You mentioned earlier that it's almost like a recipe. And I think a recipe is a great form by which to kind of establish your expertise or authority on a subject. It's like, I'm the one telling you how to do this is how you do it. Yeah. And you kind of read a recipe as, okay, I'm consulting the expert. I'm I'm going to trust this authority. And so by writing it that way, she kind of gains that authority. Right. And that really helps reach and make those connections kind of resonant in that same way. Yeah. Maybe recipe is, is the best way to describe it. I want to mention one last thing. The the paragraph you read, I really liked the way that she had the knife and cutting metaphors. Never reused words, right? She had initial incision. She talked about uh, a dagger. She talked about razor sharpen your words, thrust the dagger, slice. And then in the middle of that, she said, slip someone else's name into bed between the two of you, which that word slip gains a lot of imagery, I guess, from all the dagger and slicing and cutting metaphors and words that are being used here. But it also recalls the first line of the story. It's easy enough to slip the skin. I don't know. I thought that paragraph was so well done. I just wanted to mention it. Yeah. Well, if I I thought about that too, because I was thinking like when a less expert writer wants to write an action scene and there's, I don't know, like a sword fight or something, I feel like you're going to see words like sword 30 times in that paragraph. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, And like sometimes that's unavoidable, but it's not always like... Like fun to read that way. Yeah. Like if you're really paying attention to the language, it can, as, or like if you if you find yourself reading it out loud for some reason. But you're right. She like I think barely reuses any of these words, and at least like all of the descriptions, they end up like you said doing double duty because if you're comparing something so closely to this like gutting, then yeah, they those same words when they're used in the other part of the metaphor, they take on that meaning. And I I kind of wrote like in these notes that I made for myself, and when I saw them again just now when we were talking, I was like ah, I don't know if I feel that way anymore, but I think I still do because of what you just said. The whole metaphor with the skater butchering, it makes the relationship somehow feel like dangerous or violent or like she was something to be feared in that relationship. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I can see that. She, The way she's describing like what she did, like slip another, like that that line, slip another's name in between you and bed. I mean, she's talking about ending the breakup, but she's doing it so expertly. She's doing this like so intentionally. It's, It's like she knows how to hurt someone. Whether or not she tried to end and the relationship intentionally. She's like cutting it off really well. She's an expert that way. Well, the last line is know that whatever you consume stays lodged inside your flesh as muscle memory. Kind of, you know, now that you've done this thing, you can do it again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like it's with you. You did it. You can't escape yeah. the fact that you've done it. So what would you take away from this? My takeaway is basically the thing that I mentioned uh, earlier was bridging two concrete details with an abstract idea. The way I mentioned before, you know, you use those, you can use words that have kind of an abstract meaning, but can be applied in both instances. But I think that's such a uh, clean way to do this kind of comparison metaphor. Right. That it's, it's a really good tool. It's almost something that if you set out to do it, like if our assignment based on this was to create an extended metaphor that way like maybe she didn't have to do this but you could easily come up with 10 different ways to describe changing the oil on your car right you can come up with like all the steps for that and then you can compare that to like I don't know what the metaphor would be like quitting your job or something Yeah, and you could like come up with all of the verbs that can be used in other sentence constructions and draw kind of the conclusions that way at least like if you like that's just like an exercise and if nothing comes of it nothing comes of 
of it. But if you do have in your mind like a feeling you want to convey, like an, an extended metaphor obviously works really well. Yeah. And I guess my takeaway would kind of be along those lines. Like if you want to set out to write something as short as this, but as kind of like gripping, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing something like I'm going to write a recipe or I'm going to write a set of instructions. And you can think of other formats. We talked about this in our other mini episode, which was on YouTube only, which was like baby shoes for sale, never worn. Yeah. And the only thing I could come up with (laughs) during that episode was the idea that that was kind of based on classified ads. And if if you think of another construction like classified ads or like um, like romantic personal ads in the newspaper, like if you try to write something in a format that way, it has to be short to keep in line with that format. And so you end up with flash fiction if you do it right. Yeah, because it borrows so much meaning from its form. Yes. You gain all that by putting in that form. You know, the classified ad is like, there's so much cultural expectations around a classified ad that yeah. you gain all yeah. that by putting it in the form. Like when you are do- doing something that's that short, like you kind of have to have a kind of shortcut for the reader. They have to get into it quickly. So if they are if they know what to expect from something like classified, like that's great. And I think yeah. too, it probably helps a lot of times when we do share flash fiction um, in our workshop, like some people are always kind of like blown away that this can be done in such a short space. And I think they're underestimating themselves because they want to write something longer usually. But if you if you do constrict yourself by a format that you're familiar with, like it's probably easier than thinking like, how do I do this quickly in scene? Well, you might not be able to do a scene. You might have to do something else. That's actually really important is a lot of the advice for writing is you want to cut, 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 make it as trim as possible. But if you tell something, right, it takes more words to show it than it does to tell. So putting it in scene is showing something that you could probably tell in a sentence. Right. But that's what we want from our fiction is longer pieces. So figuring out how to make it really short is that's why flash fiction is such a difficult thing to do well is because you have to compress it all into that 600 words. Right. Well, she definitely did it here. Absolutely. Very good. Well, thanks for joining us, guys. Uh, I was worried we weren't going to hit 10 minutes.